Sam Hill is serving the seventh year of a life sentence for that murder. He says he didn't do it. This man, Dave Smith, has said time after time that he did it. But the courts simply won't believe him, even though he says he's prepared to take Sam Hill's place in jail. It's not just one life taken, it took another man's life who was innocent. I can't bring back one man, but I can do a lot more for the other. The Court of Appeal has seen a wave of victory celebrations in recent years as men and women wrongly convicted have been set free. But 55% of people who do get to the Court of Appeal end up back in jail. And that's what happened last year to Sam Hill when his appeal was turned down. The case only reached the Court of Appeal because rough justice unearthed new evidence that pointed to Sam Hill's innocence. We do not accept the Appeal Court's rejection. Indeed, we're more convinced than ever that the wrong man is in jail. Tonight, we're going to examine the judgment. We think it shows that despite its newly acquired reputation for more enlightened thinking, the Court of Last Resort can still get it spectacularly wrong. The story begins at a working men's club in Borden, Hampshire. Late one Sunday night, armed with pool cues and other weapons, a group of young men went to a housing estate to settle a score. Sam Hill and his friend Dave Smith happened to arrive just as the fight started. They were surprised to find themselves under attack. I looked through the window and it was horrendous. There was just people running around with all sorts. It was really frightening. It's just wild. As the fight broke up, a man was hit with a baseball bat. I like to see any man get up from a blow like that, you know. I could not see it myself, you know. That blow was, that blow was going to kill someone. The injured man, Malcolm Barker, was taken to hospital with a critical head wound. He died six days later. Sam Hill was charged with murder. The police had found witnesses who said he'd struck the blow. Dave Smith, then just 20, was only charged with assault. Two weeks later, Dave Smith volunteered a confession to the police that he'd killed Malcolm Barker. And a witness told the police that Smith had also confessed to her on the night of the fight. He was really in a state of shock and he said to me, oh God, I think I've killed him. And I just said, no, you, you probably just think you have, you probably just hurt him. And I sat him down and I was cleaning his face up and trying to talk to him. But it frightened me to see the expressions on his face because I realised that he probably had really hurt him. At a joint trial at Winchester Crown Court in December 1988, Sam Hill protested his innocence. He said Dave Smith was the killer but the judge wouldn't allow the jury to hear evidence of Smith's confessions on the grounds that they were hearsay, in other words, second-hand. In the absence of this, Hill was convicted of murder. Only then did the jury turn their attention to Dave Smith when he pleaded guilty to an assault charge. And only then did they hear his confession, read out by the prosecution as background to the charge. There were gasps of amazement in court. After all, the jury had only just sent Sam Hill down for life. For five years, while Sam Hill rotted away in jail, the case seemed dead in the water. Then Dave Smith decided to go public. Ignoring his lawyer's advice that he could be charged with murder, Smith made a full confession on rough justice. I've just grabbed the bat. 
and I've run down towards the crowd of people around Sam. And it's like, as soon as I get there, it's they seem to be splitting up, and I just struck the first the first person to me, and um, he 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 fell to the floor. When that was Malcolm Barker, and I thought then that I'd done some serious damage to him, to what extent I didn't know. But the police were unimpressed. While travelling in a police van, Sam Hill, they claimed, had confessed. They said that he'd told his escort he'd finished off Malcolm Barker. You are Samuel Clayton Hill, then? Yes. It's you that has been charged with murder, then? Not him? Yes. I don't know why, though. He has made statements saying he's done it. Well, someone must have made a statement saying they saw you. Or something. Yeah, I suppose so. He had the bat at first, though. I just finished him off, that's all. The police case against Hill was that while Smith had indeed hit Malcolm Barker, it was Hill who'd murdered him by finishing him off. On Rough Justice, we showed how Hill's so-called confession didn't make any sense at all. We proved that only one man hit Barker with a baseball bat. He died from very extensive brain injuries. This would be caused by a severe blow from a heavy blunt instrument, which would be directed at that particular part of the skull. Swung with some force? Swung with considerable force. In this case, there was only evidence of one blow being struck by a heavy instrument, and that was the injury I've just described. We argued that this was the blow that Dave Smith was admitting to. Well, I've just wanted to help Sam, whatever what I could, but I just didn't know how to go about it, or what to do, or who to see. So I've just had to live with it. it it's always been on my mind, it, and it always will be. Rough Justice's new evidence reopened the whole case. Now Sam Hill was granted leave to appeal. Here at last was a chance for Dave Smith to put the full story before three of the country's most eminent judges. Lord Justice Tasker Watkins and his two colleagues, Mr Justices Henry and Pill. Dave Smith spent more than a day explaining that he'd killed Malcolm Barker, but the three judges refused to believe him. Each of us found Smith to be a most unconvincing and untruthful witness. We do not believe that he struck the fatal blow. We do not believe he struck Barker with the baseball bat at all. For all these reasons, this appeal is dismissed. I don't think he ever contemplated that he wouldn't be believed. I, I mean, his whole life for the last year or so had been geared to possibly being arrested and serving a prison sentence himself for it. I feel frustrated and want to shake him and like, I'm, not, I'm not a liar, I'm telling you the truth. Who would lie about a thing like that? What we'll do is when we hit various points... Dr Eric Shepherd is a forensic psychologist who tests whether people are telling the truth, so we asked him to test Dave Smith. Try and locate where people were. Dr. Shepherd is a consultant to the Home Office, the police, prosecution and defence lawyers. Very mindful of your own sensitivity, so we won't take the bat. Like Smith was examined at length using a technique called cognitive interviewing. Dr. Shepherd claims it is more effective at unmasking a liar than the cut and thrust of courtroom cross-examination. Up through Duckman's here. If you say to someone, I'm not going to interrupt you, I want you to tell me everything that begins between A and B, the first thing we know about lying is, the first rule of lying is be economical. Here, a person's in a position where they're obliged to actually give detail. Oh, they've got the bet here and I'd have run down like, like this and stopped the first person. Walking through the scene of the crime and using a model, Dr. Shepherd asked Smith to recount every single thing he could remember. Right. You had a fence like that. If he gives me several thousands of pieces of information today, 
in a month's time, what I will want to do is to see how much of that gross amount, the several thousand pieces of information, are replicated. A month later, they went over Smith's story again. It was clear there were about 95 narrative steps in his story. It seemed to me that that story was very consistent as I moved from his verbal account to the model and then on the ground. And he's given a factually coherent, consistent, forensically reliable and valid account. I think he's telling the truth. Dr. Shepard believes Dave Smith, we believe him, so why don't the Court of Appeal believe him? First, the judges point out that when he was arrested seven years ago, Smith denied hitting Malcolm Barker. But it's now clear Dave Smith's denial was on legal advice. Tonight, the first lawyer to handle the case reveals his confidential discussions with both Smith and Sam Hill. Sam was literally pacing up and down the, the cell. Anxious, angry, extremely worried. He couldn't have emphasized more clearly, more overwhelmingly to me, that I should speak to Dave Smith and that I should tell Dave Smith that he must now, if I can use his phrase, come clean or tell the truth. I said this to Dave, and I remember the advice. As the finger isn't pointing at you, you would be charged with a lesser offence. The consequences are far less serious for you. If you believe that, then you may also believe that the evidence as against Sam Hill will not stand up in a court of law. But that is a risk you take. Smith took that advice and stayed silent. But as we know, he later changed his mind and volunteered a confession to the police. Although Smith was now admitting he'd hit Barker, he claimed it was in self-defence. The appeal judges called this a tissue of lies. Bob Booker was the lawyer representing Smith at the time of his police confession. Once again, there's a very straightforward explanation for Smith not telling the whole truth at that time. I think it's quite clear that he's trying to do his very best to tell the truth. I think he did that to a certain extent when he first instructed me, but he was also a very frightened young man and therefore naturally was going to say no to certain questions put to him, such as, did you murder Mr. Barker? He's not going to say, well, of course I did. Um, I've not met many people who do in those sort of circumstances, certainly those who I've, I've dealt with. I tried to um, cover my own tracks a bit by half telling the truth and half covering myself at the same time. And I think that's, that was my biggest mistake, because then whatever I say after that, they can say, well, you didn't say it here, so you must be lying here. That's a mistake I made myself. And something they're always going to pick up on. They're trying to say that I'm inconsistent, where with me, I've half told the truth, now I've come told the whole truth. It's, it's no good in half truth, you've got to have the truth. At the appeal court, Dave Smith claimed he'd also confessed to his aunt and uncle within minutes of the fatal blow. The judges didn't believe him. His relatives now live in Fife. They still have a clear and vivid recollection of that night. Just a family were sitting watching television, uh, usual Sunday night. I'd been out in the afternoon and I knocked came to the door. My nephew David came in. He was all agitated and he, he was pure white. And he, his actual words to me was, I think I've fucking killed somebody. No, this was in the entrance hall, so I took him in, into the living room. I so said, sit, sit down, you better tell me what's going on. He was convinced that he had... If he hadn't killed the lad, then he knew that the lad would be in hospital. Very seriously hurt. I think he mentioned the fact that he'd hit the lad in the head. That wasn't a concocted. That was a man that was shit scared. Or a boy at that time. He was terrified. He knew he was in big trouble. We were expecting a visit ourselves from the police. You know, if David had told them that he had been at our house that night, we thought the police would be at us. 
you know, to ask us what David had said. But nobody came. Nobody came. You didn't drop your family in it, did you? As far as I knew, he was keeping quiet, so I was keeping quiet. As more of Dave Smith's submissions come to light, the more convincing he becomes. But when the Court of Appeals arguments are analysed in greater detail, they appear increasingly curious. In dismissing Smith, the appeal judges relied heavily on the original prosecution witnesses against Hill. Yet their evidence was shot through with contradictions. The prosecution's chief witness had been Keith Haddington. In court, Mr Haddington gave a long and detailed account of what he claimed to have seen. He said he first saw the victim, Malcolm Barker, standing and talking to this woman, Tina Berryman, another prosecution witness. But in court, she said she'd never stopped to speak to Barker because she was always walking behind him. Secondly, at the trial, Keith Haddington was adamant Sam Hill raised the bat, one-handed, over his left shoulder to hit Barker. But every other witness who said they saw the blow said the bat was raised two-handed and over the attacker's right shoulder. Thirdly, Haddington said Hill had also hit this man, Paul Upson, on the head. But in court, Mr Upson said it just didn't happen. How can Keith Haddington have made so many mistakes? We think it's because he was describing something he didn't actually see. He didn't arrive until after the blow had been struck. Haddington says he saw this man, Sean Flanagan, being helped down the alley and into a car. He claims all this happened before he saw Malcolm Barker being hit. But Flanagan insists this was impossible. He says he was helped to the car after the blow was struck. Only then did Haddington arrive on the scene. I thought, I see Keith Haddington's car then, I was just pulling out, trying to park in then. Keith Haddington was not there and he could not have seen the blow I see. In their lengthy judgment, the judges made no reference whatever to these major conflicts of evidence between prosecution witnesses. They seem only to have subjected Dave Smith's confessions to critical analysis. If they're going to start nitpicking about the fresh evidence and the witness who's standing at that particular moment and say, well, he said that then and he said something else then, then they've got to apply the same approach to credibility, demeanour, all those things they like to think are important, to all the rest. Now, demeanour they can't do because they can't see the witnesses. Inconsistencies in account, they certainly can because they can look at the transcripts of evidence and the statements that were made before trial to weigh that up. And now, they must be even-handed about it. So if they're going to try and destroy the credibility of this, they've got to look at the credibility of that. And it seems to me at the moment they're very selective. In rejecting Dave Smith's story out of hand, the appeal judges said he'd made the elementary factual error of putting the killing in the wrong place. His account of striking Barker when on the grassed area is wholly inconsistent with the considerable evidence that Barker was struck from the rear in the alleyway, as Smith readily accepted, it was quite a different place. But once again, the judges were not being even-handed with the evidence. The appeal court placed very little weight on the one prosecution witness who had a grandstand view of the fight from this window. She also knew Dave Smith and Sam Hill, and she certainly knew the victim because he was her brother. Philippa Barker originally told the police that night that she'd seen a man strike her brother with a bat. She was quite certain the attack had taken place near the grass outside, not down in the alley. This was exactly what Smith said. Philippa Barker's account tallied precisely with that of Smith's. But the appeal judges made no reference to this fact. They said only Hill had told a story that corroborated Smith's. Only the appellant, who could not, of course, be said to be independent, gave an account anything like that now given by Smith. So where does that leave the judge's point that the victim's body can't have been in two places at once? Malcolm Barker was found in this alleyway, yet Dave Smith has said all along 
that he fell where he struck him, just a few yards ahead near the grass verge. So how can these two different places be reconciled? Well, there's a simple answer. Malcolm Barker's body was moved from here to there. This witness, Tina Berryman, said she saw people move the body a few yards down the alley. And this witness, David Cole, said he helped drag the body down the alley. Since the appeal, he's sworn this affidavit. I went down to him, leaned over, grabbed Barker's other arm, and together we dragged him some three or four yards. The appeal judges said Smith's account was further undermined because he was wearing a suede jacket on the night of the killing. In cross-examination, Smith agreed that witnesses at the trial had said that the man who had struck the blow was wearing a camouflage jacket. He agreed that he was not wearing a camouflage jacket that night. Hill, on the other hand, the judges pointed out, had worn a camouflage jacket. Once again, the judges were being highly selective. In fact, witness descriptions of the killer's clothes varied wildly. Paul Upson said it was a brown Parker jacket, and Tina Berriman said both Hill and Smith had been wearing camouflage jackets. But the one witness with a bird's eye view was sure of her facts. Philippa Barker said her brother's attacker wore a suede jacket. The selectivity of this appeal judgment goes one remarkable step further. While dismissing Dave Smith's many confessions, the appeal judges accepted the single alleged confession of Sam Hill. Someone must have made a statement saying they saw you or something. Yeah, I suppose so. He had the bat at first, though. I just finished him off, that's all. Lawyers have found the decision to accept this evidence curious, to say the least. Nowadays, police interviews are not meant to be conducted in the back of a van, and if somebody does start speaking, there are strict procedures to be observed. At the point at which somebody says they want to speak, then whoever's present, whatever, officer or not, should obviously not say, don't speak at all. They, could, they can't tell them to shut up. But what they can do is say, look, be very careful. You, this is after charge, you've been cautioned, you don't have to say anything. But if you're sure you do want to say something, then I suggest you wait. I will contact my senior officer, we will get your solicitor in, you can get advice, and it will all be properly recorded. And what you've just told me, I will repeat at that point in time, and you can, dis you know, you can then make a comment about it, or dispute whether you said it, or in these terms, or whatever. If those procedures are not followed... Then it should be inadmissible. Nevertheless, the judges let the disputed confession stand. In our judgment, this was not an interview, but unsolicited comments arising out of an innocent conversation, albeit one that a more experienced police officer would not have embarked on. There's a second problem with this so-called confession. It makes no sense at all. As we've already shown, Malcolm Barker was hit only once with the bat. So how on earth could Hill have finished off Barker with a second blow? The judges came up with a brand new conspiracy theory. What Hill said seems to us to be quite consistent with an attempt by him to persuade the police to accept the smokescreen that we believe Hill and Smith sought to create by Smith's voluntary statement of December the 3rd. The Court of Appeal appears to be suggesting that Smith and Hill cooked up a plot. First, so the conspiracy theory runs, Smith confessed to the police that he hit Malcolm Barker, knowing, of course, it was actually Hill. Then, a few days later, according to the three judges, Hill deliberately confessed to the policemen that they'd both hit Barker. This cunning scheme was designed to confuse the police so they wouldn't know which man was actually guilty. To have come together in some form of conspiracy uh, that was going to lead to the responsibility being shifted so much about that you could not pin it on either of them, I think you've got to be pretty clever. Um, there are a lot of clever lawyers involved in this, but I don't think the participants are necessarily that clever to be able to put together that kind of conspiracy.
You don't think they were capable of that I don't, sort of? No. I don't think that, that Dave is sufficiently sophisticated to um, conspire with something that would take enormous degree of planning and care. Um, it, it, it doesn't. It requires a different kind of character to Dave. Um, Dave is a much more impulsive, um, emotional sort of person. He isn't somebody who would calculate how to conspire to, after all, um, put himself in the frame. The risk that anybody runs, the moment they are saying they're responsible for a murder, the risk they run, unless they've got a stone cold alibi and they're in prison at the time, short of that, then they're running the risk that they will be convicted. Because you cannot say whatever possible outlet there is that a jury will necessarily believe that outlet, particularly if there are inconsistencies and so on. So the moment you put your hand up to something as serious as murder, then the risk is you'll go to prison for life. What the appeal judges were not prepared to countenance was that from the start, Dave Smith's stream of confessions were motivated by a guilty conscience. I think what I've done to, to him, to his family, not only his, his family, but he had a, a wife and a kid, and I've got a kid, it just makes you feel, feel different, think different. Like you know what you took away from a child, you took a father away, you took a son away from a mother. Well, I've got a mother and I'm going to have a child too. Something I feel strongly, strongly about, it's something I've got to do, this is. Just the consequences don't worry me. If, if I was in there doing life in Sam's shoes, at least it'd be the right person doing that time. All the old familiar criticisms of the Court of Appeal characterise the judgment against Sam Hill. The decision stubbornly supports the status quo, it is unfairly selective of the evidence, and it is remote from the world the rest of us inhabit. This case is surely a matter of common sense. For nearly seven years, Sam Hill has denied a killing. For all of this time, Dave Smith has confessed to it. In doing so, he risks a life sentence. But somehow, three of our most distinguished legal minds could not see it in such uncomplicated terms. Sam Hill's lawyers will now petition the Home Office to refer the case back to appeal again. Let us hope that the Court of Appeal's last judgment is not its last word. I, d I don't know their, their reason of thinking and, and how they think. I can just sit here and tell you the truth time and time again and, until hopefully he gets out.